don't know if it's a white monopoly capital thing <laughs> or what's going on. <laughs> but um, I think this, I, I find that being a talk show host and also consuming current affairs, we tend to lose track of what happens. We move on from one story to the next and the next disaster, the next scandal, the next shame. And we forget about some of the stories and what we have gone through. And in reading the book, I got reminded of a couple of things that we tend to forget because we need to get on to the next one. And I think it is important, as it was introduced, for us to have that chronicle of events. And we can debate the content and the point of view and how a particular story, incident, scandal affects us depending on the perspective that we come from. But I think when I, and I'll put this to you again on the fire. Looking at the title, the first time I saw it, my first reaction was, really? Is he the enemy of the people? Because we live in a world right now, or in South Africa, where we're debating a lot around what actually is wrong, from whose perspective, what is the issue, history versus today. And is it not presumptuous to state it like you did, that he is the enemy of the people? Thank you, Bukit. So good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I, th I, I think I'm glad that in the way you summarize the book, because that's exactly what we tried to do, both of us work in a fast-paced digital world of journalism, where stories break by the minute, literally, and we move on so fast from the first scandal to the next, there's almost also this fatigue that sets in that I've experienced from the public side, you know, where you know, the scandal has to be so big, a few, a few years ago it was millions, now then billions, and now we're moving into the trillions phase, you know, there's also a company called Trillium. <laughs> But, um, you know, so, so that's exactly what I tried to do, and thank you for acknowledging that. Um, the title of the book, it's something we debated for a while, because we were, there were a number of titles. So let me say this, and I'm glad you asked the question. You're one of the first to ask it, actually. There was a number. So the one was Bad President. Uh, the one was Above the Law. Terrible idea, that. <laughs> and ultimately, it was Enemy of the State, and then... You know, one day I was sitting on Twitter and I, I, I saw a, a tweet from a, from a person that I follow who said, um, Jacob Zuma, and, and we quote this tweet right in the beginning of the book where he actually said, where this uh, person states, Jacob Zuma stole from the people and he became the enemy of the people. And I think this theme ran through the entire book. The longer we wrote it, the more we rediscovered ourselves stories like Nkanda, the absolute shame it was Nkanda, the absolute, you know, uh, uh, way in which Zuma survived that. Um, moving to, to, to the, the, the gutting of uh, the state institutions, of the criminal justice sector. Not even talking about the Guptas and state of enterprises. We realized that this president was actually governing against the people, not in favor of the people. Because everything Jacob Zuma swore to do when he was sworn in as president in 2009, he has basically broken every rule. And that was ultimately confirmed by the highest court in the land, the Constitutional Court, in the Nkanda judgment. Um, and we were in the end comfortable that, 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 that this individual on Twitter summed it up very well to say he's the enemy of the people. The theme, the people, we the people, is obviously very much part of the ANC struggle against apartheid. And that theme has now come up even in court judgment by the Constitutional Court, where Judge Mohuen referred to we the people. So the people is very much a, a well-known phrase in our country. And uh, you know, ultimately the argument is that, that we make is when a president goes rogue, he's no longer governing for the people, but, but becomes the enemy of them. I want to, at some point, also discuss the reactions to the book, um, reactions to the two of you, and how, as a country right now, we at a point where there are times when we react to the person and not necessarily the content, but also, we tend to not have honest conversations about the content and get distracted also by the people. But I also want to just be clear that I could talk to these guys forever um, and take up this hour because that's what I do for a living. But I would want to also give you an opportunity um, 
most importantly, any questions that you might have, those who have read the book, uh, questions you might have for them, uh, please just put up your hand and, and we'll make sure that you put the question to them. You mentioned Ngadala, right? So I want to read something and I'm going to come to you real quick. So in the section on Ngadala, there's a, there's a it, it reads, um, Mandy Square reads, raised the ire of the presidency and the Department of Public Works, who initially lied to her, saying they knew nothing about the development, then changed their tune, accusing the newspaper of attempting to embarrass Numa, and finally, the presidency issued a statement to all media before the mail and guardian went to print. I've never done this in public, but the line that you referred to is, that was me. Huh? Right? No, let me explain. Seriously. So, I worked as a spokesperson for the Minister of Public Works. Breaking news. No, don't act like you don't know this, please. The two of you know this. If you did your research, if you read the story by Mandy, you would know. But the point though is this, right? So, working as a spokesperson for the Minister of Public Works, I think I was two months into the job. I get a call from Mandy saying, this is what's going on. And my first question was, what is God? I had no idea what it was. And then the way it works is that if you're in the ministry and there's a question that comes, it goes to the department. The department provides you information. You sign off with the minister and then you give the information. It was only when I left in 2010 that I understood that the information given was actually a lie. But the reason why I'm telling the story is that if we're going to talk about the impact that certain things that happen in our country and what happens from government's perspective is that it doesn't only affect South Africans in general, but also government officials who we need to remember that they're actually ethical people who are in government, who are there to actually work and serve people instead of the picture that is painted of everybody is corrupt. And Peter, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this and the question really to you is, does collateral damage everywhere we go, whether it be government or the country? For you in tracing the story of Jacob Zuma or the ANC, which part of the story impacts on you the most and even inspired you to, to actually chronicle this? Okay, so thanks. I think, let me kick off by saying you're exactly right. There are a number of good civil servants in government, and we come across them every single day. Um, there's, a, there's unfortunately a narrative that the whole of government is corrupt, and that's just not true. Um, there are some wonderful civil servants um, who try to do their best uh, job that they can uh, within the constraints that they have. Um, you know, in, in the book we also write, a big part of our book is how the people fought back because we do believe that there's a big fight back, uh, there, there's strong resistance to this big project of state capture and civil servants play a very big part and you know, I really feel for you if you tell, if, if you know, I, I don't know you were the spokesperson but you know, the one thing that Jacob Zuma has done very well over the last decade of his rule um, was to just be one step away removed from everything, from all you know, it's, it's very difficult to find his fingerprints on every single thing. Um, if you look specifically at the Nkanda uh, saga, um, you won't find his fingerprints on the, on, the, on the invoices for the air conditioning at Nkanda. You won't find his fingerprints on the invoices uh, for the bulletproof uh, windows at Nkanda. Uh, but he's created an atmosphere, he's created a system, he's created an understanding where people know how to please Ubaba. And yesterday's um, ESCOM hearings in Parliament is the perfect example of that. Um, so, if you ask me what's hit me the most, and I didn't refer to it previously, is it's all, all the different scandals and incidents and, and dramas that we've had over the last decade, and, and, and many of them we've forgotten about. Um, working as a, as a working journalist, and, and, and when you work on something like Nkanda, you're intimately involved in the Nkanda saga for a number of weeks, months, or it might be even more than a year. Uh, but then you move on to the next scandal, and, 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 and that's what impacted on me the most was um, that this man got away with so much for so long that the ANC have been unable for a long period to rein in this president, most notably after the firing of Nkhlan Nene as Minister of Finance, 
the firing of Praveen Gordon as the Minister of Finance, which were, you know, we always think there's a tipping point, but we've had a number of tipping points in the last five years, the last 18 months. Um, but, but the fact is that state capture, misgovernance, um, impacts all of our lives. It impacts on, on, on the poor more, more than it does the middle class. Um, and and what, what inspired us to write this book is that we really do believe that you know, we've survived worse in this country. This is a bad president, it's a bad government, but we've survived worse. We know, uh, uh, you know we're very much aware of our, uh, of our terrible history. Um, and if we can survive that, we certainly can survive this man. Um, and we do believe that everything that's happened over the last 18 months to a decade, uh, it's drawn South Africans together in a way that, that probably hasn't happened since 1994. We, we've seen that in the rise of civil society. We've seen that in, 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 a, in, a, in a confidence in, in, in some of our institutions that still, that still perform their duties very well. So, you know, what impacted on me was the, 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 all, the, all the, 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 the number of incidents that there has been um, and the fact that we really do believe we'll survive the rule of Jacob Zuma, and, and hopefully we'll come through this much stronger. You mentioned the, the history that we come from, and I think one of the, the challenges right now is you write this book, the two of you, two white men, <laughs> Buddha scenes, right? And then you write about Jacob Zuma, yes. right? Yeah. The reaction and, 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 and I've listened to some of the, the interviews that you guys have had on other platforms where people put the question to you like, but Adrian, why is it that you don't want to talk about Foster and Malan? Yeah, yeah. Are, you, are, you, are you picking on Jacob Zuma as a white journalist, speaking about a black president? How do you respond to that? Look, our response has been very consistent. Firstly, we, we started by saying this book largely culminated in this this term of state capture that, that has really become very popular as the era two in our country. Um, but it's not a new phenomenon. It's, been, it's, it's as old as the mountains. Um, it's not only happened in South Africa or even Africa. It's, it's, it's a concept where a certain elite or a certain group of people literally take over the state through policy, etc., and ultimately culminating in the region. And, the, and apartheid was a very large extent of state capture project. And it's very well chronicled in books like Annie Van Furen's book um, uh, that, that came out earlier this year, which I think you should read in conjunction with our book and Jock Poe's book and Chippy Alder's book, because ultimately what we're talking about here is the ability of an elite, whether it's a national party elite or a Jacob Zuma Gupta elite, because it's not an NC elite, it's a Zupta elite, right? That's captured the state to their advantage, making appointments of people who's been captured, uh, taking, taking money that was supposed to be the, supposed to uplift the people of the free state through an agricultural project and funding a private family's wedding at Sun City. I mean that perverse. So so we are we are saying state capture irrespective of the people in governance. And we are currently uh, we are we are both relatively young, as you can see. No. Um, and, and, come on. And, um, and and you know we are currently working in a country in a newsroom where Jacob Zuma is a president, the AIDS is the president, of the governing party. So we believe it's been our duty to write this book about this time. You know, if another uh, administration captures government, we write about that too. And um, by doing that, you are not denying the injustices of the past. You are not saying it didn't happen, and you are definitely not uh, saying uh, you cannot write about that. Or people like Anita Fruin has got has not got the similar rights to write about what happened. It's terrible that there wasn't the type of vibrant media and press we have now during apartheid. The stories must come out, and I believe a lot of it will spill um, through things like Open Secrets that's recently been published on our platforms. Um, but it's our duty now as journalists working in this country, irrespective of who we are and what we look like, to write this story. Can, can I just add yes, back, okay, so, you know, as on, on a very basic and a very uh, almost voyeuristic level, you know, we're journalists, and we've, we've had the wonderful privilege to, uh, to, to observe the Jacob Zuma presidency from up close uh, for a decade now. You know, the book starts at Polo um, and, and that's where the, that's where our story starts. So, I, I just want to add what Adrian says, there's just no way that we disown the past, you know. Uh, we, we come from a terrible, divided uh, past that was, that was, that was, um, yeah, that, that was based on, 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 a, on, a, on a, an institutional system of racial discrimination. So, you know, there's, we, we don't disown that, we don't deny it, but, you know, as, as working journalists, we, we've been exposed to to how Jacob Zuma operates, you know, how Jacob Zuma came to power, 
what he did with that car and how he abused that car and how it's affecting every single one of us and how it's affecting the poor of this country more than it's affecting us. Any questions that you might have, I can, I can, I can do this. Um, Matt at the back and then we'll come to you, sir. I, I, the reason I want to ask this question now is because it dovetails with compared to what you just asked the journalists. Um, something that I have found immensely disappointing in the last few weeks, I haven't read your book, but I have read your Poe's book, is how um, Zuma's corruption or Zuta corruption has been conflated with um, a narrative, particularly in white middle class environments, in the Twitter sphere of a black government is ineffective. And something I have found very, very disappointing is how I haven't heard Jacques Poe distance himself from that narrative or criticize that narrative. And I wonder if as journalists, you actively distance yourself um, from that narrative and say that that is not the purpose of this book. Um, because there do seem to have been some very unfortunate, unfortunate is a, is a misnomer, incidents with, with people making comments in book launches like this about a black government. Um, and that makes me deeply uncomfortable. And so I just wonder how you handle that as journalists. Look, if, if, if I had to um, not do anything that could potentially be taken up by racists as a cause, I would do nothing. I would not do any work. So, um, you know, I can't make decisions based on my career or my life, based on what the racists are going to say, because then they are actually directing the way I do my job. And um, all I can say is that, of course, this is not about a black government. This is about a bad president called Jacob Zuma. Um, a, a lot, most of, I can promise you the majority of the sources who give us documents who blow the whistle of black people in civil servants and in the ANC who wants this country to work and who wants this country to work for all. So, um, yes, I will on any platform always uh, uh, take on people who abuse this narrative for their own racial points of views. And if you followed our careers, uh, especially in our previous roles as journalists in the Afrikaans uh, newspaper world, you would, have, you would have known that. So. Um, we have absolutely no time for racists. Um, what we're interested in is a, is a country working. We've both got small kids. We want this country to work for our kids. We believe that they can live in prosperity in this country and can work towards a better future uh, where, where uh, the institutions must be strong. The institutions of democracy must be strong. The media must be strong. The judiciary must be strong. And I think there's more than enough South Africans who agree on that to make it work. I just want to add, in American football is a term, uh, you run interference uh, when you want to uh, take the, uh, you, we want, to, want to take the attention away from what's actually happening on the field. And that's what's happening now. You know, we've seen it with Val Pottinger, we've seen it with the debate around white monopoly capital. Mm. Um, you know, so it's, 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 it's a way of diverting from the issues. Um, I don't think we'll be diverted from writing and covering about what's wrong in this country, but equally so, not, we won't be diverted from writing and talking about what's right with this country. One of the things that's right with the country, and we write about it extensively in the book, is the rise of civil society is what's working in this country, our institutions uh, that are working. And we saw last night with this uh, Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Public Enterprises what's working. Um, you, had a, you had a black advocate there who is at the top of his game, um, tackling uh, an ANC minister uh, in an open forum and tearing them apart, or her apart. Um, you know, so that's something that works. So let's not give the racists any ammunition. Um, you know, we, like I mentioned, we believe in the country, um, but we won't be deterred from doing what we're doing, uh, just because they, they say what they are. <coughs> yeah, I think my question is, um, as journalists, we've say we've been um, in the field for, for more than 10 years, right? Um, how much of your work when you look into the so-called state capture of business do you take into account the fact that the media in South Africa do not start disliking the president when you came to whether or not you dislike the president because of the balanced natures, but a certain fundamental, like what the president himself represents, right? So you have Jacob Zuma coming in as someone who's so called traditionalist from KZM, who topples one middle class black person who went to India to start. So there's a, there's a problem. Before Zuma becomes even the leader for corruption, there's already a narrative of disliking Zuma just as what he represents. An uneducated person coming from case and death thinks that they can lie to this guy. And also, this thing plays quite itself playing into, for example, you, you yourself admit that there is nothing that links Zuma to many of these things. 
So for example, Kanda, uh, many of the corrupt um, incidents that we have, we hard to find the president implicated himself as a president. But for some reason, we are able to find our way to implicate him. Now, my question is that is it because he is implicated, or is there also something about just a dislike of the image that he represents? Not the person. Second of all, there's something you admitted just now that there was already state capture or whatever um, before Zuma. Um, you mentioned the past of apartheid and other people. Then my question is, is it then um, correct to say how Zuma stole South Africa? If there was state capture before Zuma, then did Zuma, like, for it, so it was already stolen. So wait, the, 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 the question of the people, how it stole South Africa for the people. If you say that it was already captured by a certain, the certain cabal that captured the state, then clearly if you captured the state as well, it's only captured from a certain uh, group of people. Then the question becomes, is it fair to say how Zuma stole South Africa from the people? If you yourself admit that it has always been stolen. So then the question becomes, who's the people that talk about? So just to briefly answer your question, please read our book. And if you read our book, you will see that there's absolutely no reference to the fact that Jacob Zuma has, has no tertiary education. And we can talk about it for a long time. There's absolutely, we, 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 hello? We uh, uh, regard that as, as, as non uh, 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 relevant to this debate. Because um, what I despise most is people who say Jacob Zuma is stupid or he can't count, because then you miss the point actually. Because there's no way that a stupid person could have survived for 10 years by doing what he has done to our country and to our institutions. So we did not make that point at all. Um, there was a very specific historical context in which you couldn't get education, which we acknowledge and accept. Um, this is not about liking Jacob, disliking. This is at looking at what he has done, what he's been done on his watch to the ANC, to state institutions, to the state of enterprises, and how he's opened the fiscus of this country, treasuries for his son and the Gupta family. Um, so, so, so that's the first point. The second point is, this book is about the Zuma era. We make it clear. This, this book is no, not by far an attempt to write the history of South Africa. This, is ten, this book is about an attempt on how Jacob Zuma stole South Africa over the past 10 years. If you look at the damage that's been done in the, just in the past 10 years to institutions like the National Prosecuting Authority, and there's someone here tonight who knows that story much better than I do, Dennis Breitenbach, read a book on the NBA. You will see what has happened. If there's a quote in our book by uh, Chief, by, by Justice Johan Kritler, retired Constitutional Court Judge uh, Johan Kritler, who says the, the, the public must still realize that a captured prosecutor is much more dangerous than a captured judge, because if the prosecution service is captured, the, the cases won't even make it to court, irrespective of of being aired in court. So uh, please read the book, and we'll talk some more later on. I'm I'm more than happy to to have this uh, discussion further with you. Just, just on that, um, I mean, one of your, your, your chapters is who will guard the guardians, right? So you have the story of Nkolesi Hassana and him standing his ground at a certain point, and then he had to be pushed out. Just yesterday, you read of a major climb down on the part of the president's um, uh, legal rep, admitting that what happened there was actually illegal and this is yet another I mean, you could add this to this is case number 11 out of your 10 cases that changed another chapter that you have in the book and i mean you, you mentioned that glennis has got her, her story as well about what is happening there but i think part of the difficulty in in where we are in south africa is being able to have some of these conversations separately I acknowledge that there is an issue because you can't, it can't be that you see the climb down around Ngolis Hassana, which we've seen in the Supreme Court of Appeals as well in the uh, uh, spy tapes matter and a couple of other examples where the president got it wrong. But we can have that discussion while also having the discussion and the issues that, that he has raised as well. And I think we, we find ourselves in a very difficult position in this country where how do we balance those conversations, and I struggle with that every evening on, on the show, where you find that people can't have one discussion without citing something else, or admitting to something while also acknowledging something else. And a lot of it also has to do with past and, and present. But what is the danger of 
ignoring what is happening with the NPA? What is the danger of ignoring the climb down that we saw yesterday where the president effectively said, what I did there was wrong? Because it raises questions of, so if there was something illegal in getting rid of Masana, what does it mean for Abrams now in his position and the future of the NPA? Let's look at this in broader context, and we write about this in the book as well, and it's something that everyone needs to understand, is that uh, we're a constitutional democracy and we're governed by laws, um, and we have a number of institutions that support democracy and that make sure that our democracy works. The National Prosecuting Authority, the South African Revenue Service, the SABC, National Treasury, a number of these institutions and government departments are departments and institutions that are now compromised. Uh, if you look at the importance of the National Prosecuting Authority, the NPA has been an institution, Glynis and Shout if we're wrong, that's been under pressure for more than 10 years. How many national directors of public prosecution, public prosecutions have we had since Bulalani and Luka uh, left the office uh, in the early 2000s? Amidst the, 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 Jacob, the growing scandal around Jacob Zuma, uh, the growing scandal uh, uh, around the arms deal. So, 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 so Arden mentioned it now, if, if the prosecuting authority does not work, then it can manipulate uh, what cases go to court and what, what cases doesn't. Um, Sean Abrams has, time and again, unfortunately, we argued in the book as well, uh, proven himself unable uh, to rise above um, the political noise of the moment. Um, he, he, he opted to appeal, um, he opted to appeal the, 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 the Jacob Zuma decision earlier this year in the High Court immediately, whereas there were a number of other important cases um, that he did not uh, opt to pursue. Uh, but that's one of the institutions that are now, that, that's now damaged. If you look at the South African Revenue Service, and we write about that extensively in the book as well, and uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, Jacques Poe writes about it as well, and then you've got a number of other books around that same issue. Um, once, once, once the Revenue Service goes, once the Treasury goes, then a country will run into trouble, because then you lose the ability to, uh, to, 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 to raise taxes, and when you lose the ability to raise taxes, then you run into the trouble that we're in now. We've got a 50 billion rand shortfall um, in revenue for the next year, which means there's less money to pay uh, on, on grants, there's less money to spend on education, there's less money to spend on, on, on health, uh, there's less money to spend on infrastructure. Um, and why was, was SARS captured? It was captured to, to enable state capture. Why was the NPA captured? Why has the NPA been hobbled? Why has the NPA been, 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 been hobbled by, by, by political decisions? It's to protect the president. And, 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 and that's, that's been a pattern of Jacob Zuma. That's been a pattern of, and, and, and just let me get back to another previous question. It's, it's not about, it's, you know, that's a different argument. We, we could probably argue it's not the ANC, it's Jacob Zuma. Jacob Zuma has captured the ANC, and he's been able to run him up, and that's impacted on an institution like the NPA. I just want to quickly add to that, quickly, if I may, um, on this issue of golden handshakes. It's become a terrible thing in our, in our public service because the two examples, the two prime examples we, we, we speak about in the book was Nkholisi Kasana and Anwar Dramat. And the argument we make in the book is that Zuma appointed pliable, checkered, dodgy, uh, uh, and in some cases incompetent people into key positions which you replace from time to time to keep the power, to make sure it's ultimately up to him who gets prosecuted and who goes to prison. Uh, in Anwar Dramat, he made a mistake. He thought Dramat was a quiet, behind-the-scenes intelligence operator from the Western Cape uh, who has a proud, a proud history of the struggle that he that will dance to his past when he closed down the Scorpions, which was really the beginning of the of, of, of the gutting of civil uh, of state institutions. Anwar Dramat came in did the right thing, saw these dockets, saw the Encantla docket, saw what was in front of him, and in his resignation letter, you will remember, he said, um, all of this started when I started to investigate high-profile politicians, and when I started to um, ask questions about these cases. And he was then discredited through an intelligence operation that ultimately led to the Sunday Times publishing a false story about, uh, a, 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 um, what was it, about the, the Zimbabwean uh, renditions. The same happened to Khalis in Kasana. The moment he started to show how independent he was, he was an attorney from KZN, relatively unknown, came into the position, Zuma probably thought this is his man. The moment Kasana showed any sign of independence, crime intelligence was put onto his case, we detail all of this in the book, was sent to Kozili Natal to find any type of dirt on him. They found a case when he was, I think, 18 years old and was in a knife fight with someone. 
And ultimately that led to us paying, you and I, all of us paying 17 million rand as a golden handshake to get an independent man out of the NPA who I believe wants to come back. So that's why this case is very important. I hope, I hope he doesn't spend that 17 million because he needs to just give, <laughs> give it back. And, 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 and the story I can tell is that a lot of the, those things converged in, in one week. The, the, the dismissal of Angwar de Mat, um, the dismissal of Robert McBride at the Independent Police uh, Complaints Directorate, um, the dramas around SARS. You know, there was a period a year or so, or 18 months ago, where all of these institutions came under immense pressure um, at around the same time. And that was around the time where, where the pressure increased in the presidency, where, where people moved closer and closer to expose this president. I want to come back to the question of journalists. You mentioned the Sunday Times. And, and we need to have a discussion about the, the complicity of media houses or even journalists in the issues that we have today. Matt? Yeah, I have to ask that they've never been able to nail Jacob Zuma as being president with all these corrupt things were going on. Has Zorak Tsotsi finally nailed him? Yes, Zorak Tsotsi did, last night. Yes. Put him in the room. But exactly the same with Fakey Mentor. Last year, Fakey Mentor um, told the public protector, it was published in the media as well, that she was flown up to Johannesburg, she was taken to Saxon World, the big Saxon World compound, across the Johannesburg, across the Johannesburg Zoo, uh, she was invited in, and she was offered the job of Minister of Public Enterprises. And when she refused, in comes Ubaba saying, don't worry, Tombazala, it, it will be okay. He was in the room. What happened after that? The ANC couldn't do anything. The public protector's report is being reviewed in, in court now. Last night, Zola Tsotsi put him in the room. He's been able to slip away time and again. And that's the, I want to say genius, but that's almost the slyness. That is the slyness. Oh, the I just want to add, there's another, there's a third person that we should never forget, Temba Maseku. Temba was the head of GCIS, yes. and he refused to give money to the New Age, which if we talk about the media, I'm very careful what we're talking about. The, media, the New Age and a seven is a big part of the media. And he refused to give money to the New Age, and he received the call from President Zuma to say, help the Gupta. So there's at least three people on record now with direct evidence yeah. implicating the President in corruption. So here's the thing. Whoa, that's the question. Okay, um, um, I think I saw your hand first. One of the things that I struggle with is how there seems, and we're talking about the media now, right? And there's lots of agendas. So, for example, Iqbal survey bias independent. The story immediately is you're an ANC guy. And a lot of what we end up seeing actually does not prove that to be true, right? In many different examples. ANN7 comes, and we know there are issues with ANN7, and we can have a conversation about the agenda that exists there. But what doesn't happen is, for example, the Sunday Times, the rendition story. I listened to Stefan Hofstadter, together with Jacques Paul, on UCBS's show, discussing how they got it wrong. And we don't seem to have a conversation about the complicity of media houses that are not or are outside of the perceived ANC aligned media houses. And I wonder if as practitioners in this industry, we call each other out enough to say, but it's all good to talk about AMN7 and Iqbal survey, but why do we ignore what is also happening with, for example, the Sunday Times, or even, if somebody has got proof, Media24? So, um, touch with there's no proof like that at the moment. But, uh, uh, Peter, absolutely, and we write about it in the book on how the Sunday Times was complicit in, um, in actually this, this project of creating this false narrative around the rogue unit in the South African Revenue Service. And how stories like the fact that this rogue unit supposedly ran a brothel in Durban and spied on President Zuma turned out to be completely false. The Sunday Times was punished, the editor was moved out, the investigations unit was disbanded, and the new editor was appointed to then apologize for that. Um, as a journalist, that's very embarrassing. That's, that's probably the harshest thing that can happen to your title if you have to apologize for getting things wrong week after week. Because it wasn't only those two stories, there were about, I think, 30 stories. 
as we mentioned in the book, um, how this starts, how the Sunday Times publishing, published, started publishing these stories during the time of Johan Boyce in KZN, when he was the head of the, of the Hawks in KZN, and started investigating Toshan Panda, who was another Zuma backer. So all these connect, we try to connect all these dots in the book because it's there. Go, go, it, go. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, absolutely we have to own up when we get it wrong. The Sunday Times, I think, under the new editor Bongani Sikoko, they've done really well to admit their mistakes, to try and rectify it. They were a key part of the uh, Gupta League that we published this year. So I think the tide has turned at that newspaper. Um, but history is there, and, and, and it can't go away. We did have a lot of uh, 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 arguments while we were writing the book, but one of the, one of the things that we did disagree about uh, during the writing, in the end we did agree on it, was how to portray the Sunday Times. Um, so the Sunday Times, and let me just say that the media, the media in South Africa isn't an, one homogenous organism. Um, you know, no one, no, one, no one follows the same line. Um, I think sometimes there's this idea that the, uh, that the, that the media, uh, you know, we sit around a table, we plan agendas. That, that, that's just not how it works. Uh, but we all do come with our own experiences. We all do come with our own exposure to, to events and history. And that informs what you do, how you write, how you approach the job. But, you know, getting back to the Sunday Times, we spoke about the Sunday Times. How do we cover the Sunday Times? They, 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 did, they did make a massive mistake with the Sarge stories. You know, it was... Uh, it, it had a massive impact on the body politic, it had a massive impact on SARS, and it, and it really made a big contribution into gutting that organization. But by the same token, the Sunday Times had broken some of the biggest stories around state capture over the last year. So when you research a book like this, when you work around a book like this, then you, then, then you are immersed in what they did wrong, what they got wrong around SARS. But they got so much right also um, around, uh, uh, around Fakey Mento, around Kabisi Jonas, around how the, the, the Gupta shot for a minister, around Tempo, Tempo Maseku. So it's difficult. You, you can't judge the media as one uh, organism. You can't even judge a single title as one organism. Um, it's difficult. Uh, one thing that I can tell you is that the media is under more pressure than we've been in, in it's ever since I've worked, certainly. Um, and there are more senior journalists in this room than, than, than I am, but you know, we're under pressure to get things right, we're under pressure to get things fair, um, and we're under pressure not to, be, not to become involved in the process. We're moving towards the ANC's conference in December, and the danger is, of course, that you might become involved as a player, because you are exposed to the power brokers. They know you've got access to a market, they know you've got access to readers, and they want to use you. So it's a, it's a difficult dance to do. It's a, it's, it's a dance with a number of devils. I'm coming to, I just need to deal with this one, just one. Language is important, right? Why is it that when we talk about the Sunday Times, we talk about a mistake? Versus different language that you use, that we would use in talking about other... It, it's almost like they're being excused from this to say, you were, you were correct, you, you got it wrong, it was a mistake. Okay, and then there was a sanction, and then we've got new guys in power or in, in, in editorial, and we're moving right along. But the victims of that mistake is Pele, Van Lochenberg, you name them. So why, why, why is it a mistake? It's, it's maybe because my English vocabulary isn't too, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can say it was collusion. And you could argue that there was collusion between the Sunday Times and whatever forces were deployed to try and uh, un undermine Praveen Gorda Treasury and the South African Revenue Service. Because the fact of the matter is um, that the, 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 the coverage that uh, the Sunday Times for almost a year gave to the so-called growth unit led to the gutting of one of our most important institutions. It led to, to the loss of skills, the loss of institutional knowledge, uh, to the loss of a, of, a, of a number of units, not one, a number of units uh, that were deployed to look at illegal and illicit financial flows. Um, now SARS, for many years, on a jump in here, was one of our premier institutions. It almost became, I don't want to say it became sexy to pay your taxes, but people wanted to pay taxes because you knew when you pay your taxes, you make a contribution to the rebuilding of this country. Um, by January this year, 55 senior executives have left SARS employ, and News 24 today reports around another senior uh, uh, SARS official that have left. So that's, that's a direct result of uh, the Sunday Times failure, uh, probably, and I don't want to litigate the Sunday Times tonight, but, 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 but it's, the, it's their failure to adhere, I suppose, to, to, to journalistic principles. Uh, you know, we're all under pressure in journalism to, to get the sexiest story out there, to be first. 
um, but, but we have to be very careful. Uh, while, while we do have that ambition, we have to stick to, 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 to journalistic principles as far as we can. Not at all, okay? all the time. Yeah. So just to walk back, Adran, thank you for mentioning whistleblowers. So in particular, with regards to the Protection of State Information Bill and the Whistleblower Protection Act, we know what the mechanism is. Mm. I'm not asking you to talk about your sources and how you protect them. But from an institutional point of view, from a civil society point of view, how are we seeing that mechanism in practice with regards to these good government guys and whoever else may be in various guises and institutions who are coming forward with this information? Do you think it's satisfactory? Unfortunately, I think that uh, not enough people know about the protection that's available to whistleblowers. I still get a lot of people who contact us who are so scared. And, you know, some of them do face dire consequences. Um, when they, when they leak us information um, in the public interest. You know, and I always say to someone, people, people always dismiss sources because they're somehow, sometimes uh, labeled disgruntled. But my question is always, maybe there's a bloody good reason why they're disgruntled. Because maybe they saw their boss paying a bribe, for example. So um, I don't think there's enough education about that. I hope we as a media can play a bigger role in, in teaching people that there's actually legislation available to protect you as a whistleblower. <laughs> but we've seen amazing whistleblowing over the past few years. If you just think of the stuff that's come out of Trillium, for example, that showed us how, um, how, how Transat and ESCOM specifically uh, paid, paid, paid bribes, they call it what it is, through McKinsey to these companies. Um, uh, the, the Gupta leaks itself was one big tranche of, 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 of data leaked by a source. Mkandla, I mean, I, remember, I still remember the morning sitting in the City Press newsroom in Joburg and up popped this email from a Gmail account, just an anonymous Gmail account, which had to be detached, and we write about this in the book, uh, the first documentation that was leaked from the Department of Public Works, one of your colleagues, was it you? <laughs> no, you know, the cover was wrong by then. <laughs> we must be thanking cookies, so circulation well. <laughs> Someone in Public Works who leaked us the documents to prove this was back in 2009 to prove that, that uh, the, the state had now paid over 200 million rand to upgrade Jacob Zuma's compound in Kandla and that Zuma himself, that public servant wrote, had to pay back 10.4 million rand. After many years, many tears and many court cases, he ultimately ended up uh, paying back 7.6 7. 7. 6 million rand. So, um, no, absolutely point well taken. We should do much more to let whistleblowers know that there's legal protection for them. So, why should we lay most of the blame on Zuma, corrupt though he is, when, correct me if I'm wrong, every ANC MP, maybe save for one, voted to disband the Scorpions. What, the ANC is complicit. What else can you say? There's no arguments for that. The, the, the very first thing Jacob Zuma did after he became uh, ANC leader in two, December 2007, it's, it's almost a decade ago uh, this, uh, this year, um, was, was to, 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 to start disbanding the Scorpions. A, parliament, a joint parliamentary committee was appointed very early in 2008. Uh, uh, one of the chairpersons, uh, the joint chairpersons, that, the day that the committee was appointed said, it doesn't matter what you think, the Scorpions will be disbanded. And that was a pattern, uh, you know, straight through the Zuma presidency, where he, where, where he, where he was able to um, enlist the African National Congress in Parliament at the Tuli House uh, to aid and abet him in, 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 in his machinations. So it makes sense implicit. Um, so, so, so two instances, uh, after Ntlantan Nene was fired, there was a big drive uh, within the ANC, within the top six, to try and convince the president to change his mind. That was done with the help of the private sector over a, a tumultuous 48-hour period, starting on the Friday, ending on the Sunday. Um, and then the year started with uh, Praveen Gordon back at Treasury, but Praveen Gordon was under immense, under immense pressure from the very beginning. The ANC's top six and the ANC's leadership were unable to lift that pressure from Praveen Gordon, even though um, you know some of them did try. But after Praveen Gordon was fired, you remember on the Friday morning, uh, William Antasha was on uh, Ketso's colleague show in Joburg, he wasn't able to explain to, to the listeners where the reason came from, where the list came from, where, where the decision was taken to fire Gordon. So Ramaphosa the same morning denounced it, uh, as William Keys the following morning. But they were all forced to, 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 to recant on the Monday. So you're right. The ANC was complicit in this. And we write about in the book, we write about how they, uh, how they, how they uh, enlisted the support of Parliament. The Speaker, time and again, bailed this President out whenever tough questions were asked in the National Assembly. They're unable to rein in the President. They're unable to direct. 
We'll take more questions in a few minutes left, but um, the rise of civil society. The ANC and whoever else was involved effectively dismantled the UDF and what was happening there. And we've come sort of full circle where it takes the ANC and an ANC president to bring back that spirit of activism. Yes, we saw it with TAC and others during the, the Mbeki era, but with the level of activism that we see right now. Last night, I was talking to people who were uh, engaged in the anti-nuclear protests um, at St. George's Cathedral and hearing activists coming out of the Karoo to come here and talk about issues of nuclear and uranium mines. Um, the importance of, of that rise in, in activism. I think it's extremely important. I think it's, uh, um, you know, one of the uh, consequences of the state capture project of Jacob Zuma was this rise of civil society and it's a nice way you've painted it with the UDF, I agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, it, it is so inspiring for me to see organizations like um, SAFCA, who is the who is the small group of, of, of religious leaders from, from Cape Town, who really stood up against the nuclear deal and decided this was going to be our campaign and raised funds to get an attorney and an advocate, went to court and stopped the bloody nuclear deal. But I don't think we appreciate the immenseness of that case. And I would like to applaud those ladies for what they have done for our country and for our children's future because they have at least put back the nuclear deal with a year or two. The Western Cape High Court ruled earlier this year that that deal must start from scratch. So, you know, these are really people who I think, because obviously of the Constitution and the Bill of Human Rights and the freedom we have today, and the freedom to write a book like this with the President's face and enemy of the people on it, are using that freedom, are absorbing that freedom and taking action. And, and, and not just sitting, waiting for politicians to make life better, but actually taking, taking uh, action as, as active citizens. Uh, we list a number of these cases in our book. Um, Say South Africa is another example. Um, Alta. Alta now employs, according to my information, almost 60 people. 60 lawyers, activists, um, program managers, uh, 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 researchers, who literally focus on all these different kinds of state deals and litigate with have to judge Hitler and freedom under law. And so we can continue corruption work. So, so um, you know, if I can do a bit of, you know, if you have some extra sense, please help these people because they are doing a great service to South Africa. Um, you know, without us, we can only tell the stories as journalists. We can, we can help the whistleblowers to bring the stories out, publish the stories, and that's where our duty ends. We can't litigate, we can't stop political parties, we don't want to. But, you know, these people actually take the next step. Um, and I think the rise of civil society has really helped us. Without civil society, we would have had a Richard Lulee still in this position. We would have had an Nkobo Jiba at the NPA. We would have had um, uh, uh, um, the, the grant system being much worse than it is currently. Burning Clemens at walk. So, you know, uh, and the nuclear deal. So, yeah, no, absolutely take my hat off for this group. So, we, we are acknowledging that We've got civil society, we've got a working justice system. Certain things have been blocked from happening, which is contrary to this narrative of we're in disaster right now. Mm -hmm. right? Because I, I struggle with how some people choose to portray where, we, yes, we've got the challenges that we do, um, and we need to deal with them. But with everything else that is happening in response to the challenges, it doesn't in any way correlate with the narrative that is presented by some that we're in shit. Yeah. We are. <laughs> we are in shit, you know. If, if you look at the last 18 months, look what Jacob Zuma survived. He survived the firing of Nflantla Nene in December 2015. He survived a scaling ruling by the Constitutional Court in March. 2016, which in any mature democracy should surely have meant the end of, 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 of his term, term of office. He survived uh, the municipal elections last year in August, which were by far the worst election results the ANC have ever returned. Um, they lost three more metros. They lost Nelson Mandela Bay, they lost the city of Johannesburg and the city of Tswane. Um, and that's under his watch. It was, a, it was a local election fought on national issues. He survived uh, the release of the Public Protectors Report in November last year. Um, he survived all the state capture revelations since then. He survived the firing of Pravin Goran, which was a massive turning point in our country. It, 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 it was the capture of Treasury. He survived everything. So let's not beat about the bush. We are in trouble. Um, the ANC is in trouble. Um, 
But as a country, um, you know, we argue in the book that there's enough resilience in institutions, in individuals, in South Africans that we will survive this as well. That's not to sugarcoat the fact that we are in shit, like you said, because we are. Uh, but the ANC, I would argue, is even more shit. He also survived the poisoning of his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we should deal with it. So that's, that's, like, that's like a Jacob Zuma, Evan Sinema, Gwagwa, WhatsApp group. Yeah. You know, really. Where's Grace? That is, that is another story. Um, uh, sure. Uh, hi, good evening. Um, now that you guys have written the book, uh, and obviously detailing what has happened in the past over the last 10 years, there is uh, there's an election conference coming up next month. What is it that, having been so immersed and understanding the story as you, as you do at this moment, what is it that you guys would like to see the story unfold going forward? What are some of the key things that need to, to take place to try and fix some of the things that have gone wrong and that you, that, that you point out in your book? You know, just a few highlights of the key issues that must be addressed going forward uh, after the elective conference. Lukanyu, thank you so much for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, that's one of the SABC eights. <laughs> <laughs> and we write about you in the book as well. We've got it right. Um, Lukanyu, look, I think two things. I think um, the ANC has got a very, very important election coming up. People who go to that conference know what they're voting for. Um, none of the candidates are squeaky clean or are great. But the person who emerges will immediately have to return uh, uh, not only investor confidence, but also the confidence of South Africans in the criminal justice system, in the economy, in the treasury, in, this, in the uh, revenue service. So for me, the first thing that, that the winner should do after, when, when is it, 21st of December, the 22nd of December, is to appoint a new national director of public prosecutions. You know, that would be a good start. Thank you. <laughs> And, um, you know, so, so there's a lot of things you can do, you know, um, as, 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 as president to, to start cleaning up institutions. Um, cancel the nuclear deal, get the um, energy plan right. Um, uh, fire incompetent. Lynn Brown out. <laughs> there's, a, there's an opinion to get Lynn Brown out. Um, so, so, look, I think, I think if Solo Ramaphosa wins, there will be a lot of changes. Um, he's, he's clearly campaigning on that saving the ANC ticket. We can debate that for a long time over wine if you want. But I think that's, that, that, you know, he's clearly campaigning on he will save the ANC. Because Azana Namini Zuma is clearly the Zuma candidate, um, uh, disappointingly has aligned herself with the Zupta project, and completely sinks from the same Balpotin Jahim sheet, which has been discredited time and again <laughs> over the past few months. Um, and Zwelim Ki is trying to unite the ANC. Unfortunately, he seems to be the only one wanting to. Do that, so I can't see that happening. Just, just on, on, on the candidates that you mentioned, then I, <laughs> I have a problem with what seems to be the delegitimizing of Gosas and Alamini Zuma as a, an activist, a freedom fighter in her own right, where everything about her in this campaign is. Firstly, in a headline, Jacob Zuma's ex, firstly, right? But it seems as if there's this, and it, it's great, it's gaining momentum, this, this narrative of all you are is Jacob Zuma's ex, and all you stand for is what Jacob Zuma stands for. I, I've got a problem with that, that there seems to be this idea that she is not her own person. Look, that's why I said deeply disappointing campaign for me personally. I was very, I remember covering the home affairs period very well. I was not, I uh, was too young when the, when the smoking thing happened. But I mean that she gets a lot of credit for that as a Minister of Health. But at home affairs she really did well to clean up that department. And at the AU, you know, nobody really knows what she did. The consensus seems to be not a lot. But, okay, so it's very clear, it's as clear as daylight that she's a candidate of the Zuma faction money by the Guptas and people like Adriano Mazzotti. You know, why isn't she clearly dis disassociating herself from a cigarette smuggler who seems to be uh, uh, paying a large part of the campaign? You know, that's like a good place to start, maybe. 
And why is she, um, you know, the speeches she makes are almost textbook Gal Pottinger speeches that Duduzane and, 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 and Victoria Gigan and others wrote, you know. So um, if, she, if she wasn't so obviously part of that faction and, 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 and captured by that narrative, what I would have had sympathy, I agree with you on the ex-wife issue. She's much more than Jacob Zuma's ex-wife, and she divorced him probably for very good reasons. But they still have four kids together. And the argument, the popular argument inside the ANC, that ANC comrades have told me, is that she will never put the father of her children in prison. And surely you can't have that type of um, a, a person leading the country if that in fact is going to happen. Whether she will do it, would she put it in prison, I don't know. But just from the, the only thing we can judge her on is what she's saying and who she's getting money from. And we know who that is. So, whatever happens in December, Zoom is still in power for two years. How are we going to survive that? That's going to be interesting. Uh, on the morning of the 21st of December, this country will be different. Um, if Cyril Maposa wins, the immediate question we're going to ask is, how long will it take before they recall Jacob Zuma? Well, the ANC has been stunned uh, by the removal of Tom and Beck in 2008. They've been very reluctant to go down the same route. Uh, remember, Tom and Beck, was replaced in September 2008 for something much lesser than Jacob Zuma has, 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 since, uh, has since done. So it's going to be a very difficult decision, but that's going to be the, the, the first question we're going to ask on the 21st. So if Ramaphosa wins, let's talk about how long Jacob Zuma will survive. If Sir Ramaphosa is, is serious about cleaning up, if he's serious about making a break with the past, um, then there will be some big changes. Um, Lugisa Fuzili, who is the former Director General of Treasury, tells us in the book that we might be despondent at the moment about how much has gone wrong, how many institutions are under pressure, but he's very adamant and he's been in the, he's been at the apex of one of our, one of, well, probably our, mo our most important departments for more than a decade. If you make certain strategic, strategic changes at SARGE, at the National Prosecuting Authority, at the Public Protector, um, at the Ministry uh, of, of Finance, you know, then, it's, then, then we can start the road to recovery, then it can be much easier and much faster if there's a decisive break. The second thing is there also needs to be a number of public prosecutions. Senior people need to go to jail for the irregularities and the illegalities um, that have happened over the last decade. Um, if, of course, Zana Damini Zuma wins, of course, the question would be how long will the civil faction remain behind in the ANC? Will there be another split? Uh, but yes, then the chances are that, the, uh, that Jacob Zuma will probably finish out his term in 2019. The problem, of course, is the centers of two power. We saw that uh, in, in, in our pre-1994 history, how that's a problem. We saw that with Tabo Mbeki and Jacob Zuma in 2000, 2008, that the Tuli House and the Union Buildings, if there's different principles, then it, it's difficult to gel. Will Kosazana, Tamini Zuma, and Jacob Zuma get it right? <coughs> you know, they're divorced, so let's see how that pans out. Huh? Uh, your whistle blowers. How do you ever really authenticize their, their stories? For example, I hear how you sort of put me, fake, fake mentor on, on the pedestal. <coughs> the same thing that I observe about Makosi Koza. Have you ever asked yourself whether she would be <coughs> as vocal as she is? Has she been made Minister of Public Enterprises? Had she not been dropped from the ANC list in 2014, would she have been this vocal? And as for Makosi, would she be the person that she became had she been appointed Minister of Public Enterprises instead of Faith, Faith, Faith Mutambi? Look, Makosi Koz has been vocal from the very beginning, hasn't she? I mean, she's been vocal for a good while. She, the ANC's caucus is a very difficult place to operate, to operate in. Um, there's a very strict line um, that gets set from the Tuli House. Um, the ANC's caucus is run according to very strict rules and regulations. So it's very difficult for an ANC MP because of our party list system, because of our electoral system. It's difficult for an MP uh, to, 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 to be an individual, to, to make individual pronouncements and make, make individual statements. Now, that's what's been so refreshing about some, someone like Makosi Koza, who, who is someone that's, that's within the ANC's caucus, um, who is who's, who's a prominent and senior member of caucus, and has been very vocal and critical. Um, but yes, and, and that comes back to a question earlier, there, there are a number of ANC um, luminaries who, once they've, left, once, they've, once they've left power, once they've out of power, uh, found their voices, and that has been disappointing, you're right. Just to uh, answer on the whistleblowers, absolutely, the first lesson you learn in journalism is to investigate your source first. So we do that all the time, we check out the documents, we try and sensitize it, 
in terms of the group that leads, no one has come forward to prove that it's not authentic. Um, in terms of Peggy Mentor, the reason we included the story about her offering, being offered that job by Ajay Gupta um, and how she was asked to drop the SAA airline um, uh, in favor of Jet Airways, which we now know was the same airline that flew the Gupta guests to the Sun City wedding, was because there was overwhelming circumstantial evidence and she went under oath. There's an affidavit which she signed under oath on her version. She hasn't been challenged under oath by anyone else. So, um, of course, we don't believe everything everyone says, uh, otherwise we won't be here. Um, we, we, we are always critical about our sources, always uh, try to get two sources corroborating, and when there's documentary evidence, um, I, I believe it's still the best proof. We're out of time, final question. Um, your last chapter, and we've, we've dealt with this before that question, uh, the death race to, to December. And you, you've spoken, you've, you've painted a picture of the difference between the two candidates. Why does it seem like, this two-part question, why does it seem like it is a foregone conclusion that if it's civil, everything's going to be okay, right? Secondly, why is it a foregone conclusion that the future is with the ANC? That's an excellent question. Um, so a number of uh, ANC people or senior stalwarts are saying that we need to move beyond the ANC, that we need to start thinking beyond the framework of the ANC and beyond the paradigm of the ANC. The ANC have been on a, on a slow but steady decline since 2000 and, uh, 2009 election when, when Jacob Zuma became president, the ANC had a majority of 69.69%. That's almost 4% more uh, that they need to, to change the constitution. Um, last year, uh, uh, during the municipal election, it's difficult to uh, exactly compare local and national elections, but they got 54% support, which is which is the worst showing that they've ever had. So, so it's it's very clear that the ANC is a party in decline. The ANC is a party in, uh, with a lot of internal strife, um, and I think it's 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 correct that you say that that we need to look. We we, we can't just accept and think that the future of this country lies in the hands of the ANC. Um, there's no uh, in, in, in functioning democracies, no parties the world over has had a monopoly on power uh, forever. And, and there's no reason to believe that our country would be any, any different. As far as Ramaphosa and, and, and Lamini Zuma goes, Adrian made the point earlier that Lamini Zuma has painted herself into a corner, aligning herself with the Zupta project. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we objectively see, you know, as objective as we can. Um, given our reporting, given, given how we cover it, what, what she said, how we, how we hear her, how she moves, uh, with who she, uh, who she associates. Uh, whereas Sarah Mopoza seemingly has tried to run a campaign where he tries to differentiate himself from Jacob Zuma. But you're right, we need to remember that J uh, Sarah Mopoza agreed in 2012, Adrian, and you write about it in the book around Mongo Hoon, to run on uh, Jacob Zuma's ticket. He agreed to align himself with Jacob Zuma. Um, he's been by Jacob Zuma's side as his deputy president since 2012. Um, he has been unable to rein in Jacob Zuma. Um, we know the inner workings of cabinet and the ANC's top six are very difficult to understand, very difficult to grasp, and it's a, it's, it's a murky world. Um, so I'd argue it's, uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to pick between the lesser of two evils. But what we're hearing from the ANC, okay, so is people who support Ramaphosa says, look, the bar is quite low at this stage. Like, you're not going to get the perfect present. Okay. So let's go for someone who has enough money not to steal anymore. Let's go for someone who might actually prosecute the former president, Jacob Zuma. And let's go for someone who will break the shackles, the stronghold that the Zuptas have over the state. Let me put to you another scenario in 2019. And, and let's, let's take that home tonight and ponder. If the ANC goes to the 2019 election and goes under 50%, who will govern this country? President Maimani, Deputy President Malema? And what will that government look like? <laughs> Thank you very much. So for moderating this evening. Thanks to the team at Jonathan Ball for, as always, doing a wonderful, uh, wonderful job. 
and thanks to Lebes Leap, our wine sponsor. And just to let you know what's coming up at the Book Lounge, tomorrow we have another installment of the Thousand and One South African Stories. Next week, Monday, we have the launch of Banto Halaluso. Absorb, don't tie the way the